Christian creators often say things like, C.S. Lewis didn't mean for his fiction to teach Christian truth. Instead, he only relied on images and used his imagination. But is this what Lewis actually did? Is that what he actually wrote about his creation of the Chronicles of Narnia? And is this how Christians ought to create their fantasy stories today? This is Fantastical Truth from Lorehaven, and I am East Stephen Burnett, Lorehaven's publisher. We find the best of Christian fantasy, including science fiction and fantasy, paranormal, horror stories, anything speculative, and we love to apply the wonders, the awesome aspects of these stories to the real world that our Savior has called us to serve. And I'm Zachary Russell, and I am a Christian writer of science fiction. And we'll see if that is the correct title to give myself by the end of this episode. And you can also call me Zach. And this is episode 35. Did C.S. Lewis say, it's pure moonshine to create stories that teach Christian truth? So we're going to dive into that topic today with a uh, pretty interesting quote by Lewis from one of his essays. Uh, But first, Stephen, I have a great stranger than fantastical fiction segment for, for today. So I think you may have heard about this one. It's the year 2020. So of course, we're getting all kinds of weird and sometimes awesome things. And today's awesome thing is a giant robot. So the headline I came across earlier this week, Stephen, was uh, life-size Gundam enters testing mode. <laughs> so I thought, what? And I didn't really have to guess too much what this meant because there was a great video shared by at Katsuka on Twitter. I'm going to try to describe this thing, but it's basically what you think. It's a giant robot. And if you're a fan of Pacific Rim like I am, it's similar to like the Jaeger. Okay, so we hope this means there's no kaiju or other monsters that are trying to destroy us. But the Gundam is actually a kind of a staple of Japanese uh, fiction anime it's a mech yeah Even it's if you're mech. not an anime fan you're familiar with the mech you know pacific rim was mechs versus kaiju it was a bit of a genre mashup and a bit of an appropriation not in a bad way by uh, american filmmakers of these uh, japanese uh, anime and live action film tropes but yeah it's a, it's a giant uh, suit as it were a, a giant robot i'm pulling some details here from newsweek and forbes uh and some other sources but Basically, the robot is, uh, so Newsweek says, quote, the robot is based on a creation from Japanese military science fiction franchise, Mobile Suit Gundam, which features giant Gundams. And, and what this thing is, it's 60 feet tall and it's 25 tons. It looks like, like an armored suit you would wear. So, you know, a lot of movies have featured this kind of thing. Like you said, a mech. So Stephen, does the is there a person that is like inside of these things controlling it? Cause it's not like, like an AI kind of thing, right? It, it's like according human to control. the anime trope, there has to be at least one person actually inside, possibly the head, possibly the chest surrounded by video monitors in a special chair with multiple levers to pull and buttons to push. However, if you really want to go all out, then this robot would have to be the kind of robot that is assembled from four, possibly five smaller robots, each in turn oh. being controlled by a single individual. And then team leader fires off the signal or issues the special command. Uh, the screen splits into five parts to show the determination of all five pilots as they then, with absolute precision, join all of their various robotic body parts into one single super robot. This is more popular, uh, more known to fans of the uh, the animated series Voltron, uh, both the okay. original version and the uh, the Americanized uh, reboot. But I understand that this happens a few times in several other shows, possibly as a result of Voltron. I can't remember who did it first, but I've I've seen enough anime to actually seen it being spoofed, uh, and yeah. I'm familiar enough with the trope that it's hilarious. Like uh, in uh, in One Piece, there's a moment where three or four human pirates decide they're all just going to join together into one giant super pirate or something, but it's, (laughs) it's just a bunch of guys, you know, there's no robot suits involved. They're just all trying to grab onto each other. Is that where the mighty Morphin power Rangers, is that kind of a spinoff of, uh, Voltron? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, not, not a spinoff, but definitely inspired by, I mean, these, these tropes just get shared and built on, uh, unashamedly. 
Yeah, so it seems like the Gundam franchise has been around 40 plus years. And this uh, life-size uh, replica Gundam they created, it's, it's uh, specifically the RX-78 model. I had to look all this up because I don't, I don't know this fandom very well. But this thing, Stephen, is amazing. If you watch this video, we'll, we'll link it in our show notes. Th- this giant robot can move its head, arms, legs, torso. It could give like a thumbs up or something, and then it kneeled down. This is in Yokohama, Japan. This has been in the works since about 2014. So that was the first article I could find that mentions this. Um, they've built two other life-size Gundams, but they didn't walk. And so they were just on display, but apparently drew thousands of tourists. And then, you know, this Forbes article from 2017 says that, quote, you need to understand that in Japan and across Asia, Mobile Suit Gundam and its varied progeny are as big a deal as Star Wars in the West, if not more so, in quote. So that, that, that's what really got my attention. Okay, this isn't just like a little fringe, uh, you know, fun little Saturday morning cartoon. This is like a major franchise in Japan, which, you know, I need to talk to Naomi about this. She, she didn't get a whole lot into anime, but she's kind of aware of it from the time that she lived there. But I'll, I'll bet she's, she's seen all this around, and it, it probably just kind of was in the background be, if, uh, because it's so popular. But this Gundam they built, it's part of a much bigger establishment they're creating called the Gundam Factory Yokohama. And it's gearing up to be this learning center, an entertainment complex, an exhibition center, all in one. And so, so kids can come and learn how this robot works. And, you know, it's meant to inspire engineering and, uh, like, you know, electronics and all this kind of stuff. They were actually going to open this in October. So it's going to be this whole exhibit that people come to. But, of course, it's delayed from the pandemic. And I think the actual uh, goal of this was to have it in the opening ceremony for the Olympics that were supposed to be in Tokyo this year. That's back on the alternate timeline. Yeah. Right. <laughs> oh, I mean, can you imagine how amazing that would have been? Like this 60 foot giant mech doing whatever in the um, opening ceremony. But okay, so that's all the details. Now, Stephen, the, the really interesting thing was just all the different responses I looked at for this. So, of, of course, everyone thought this is awesome. And people are like, well, okay, I'm not really sure what it does. It's obviously not fighting other robots or kaiju or whatever. Yeah, that's fine. It's it's kind of basically an art exhibit in a sense, although one that's possible with incredible engineering. And when you combine that with the cultural significance, it's it's obviously very inspiring, I'm sure, to a lot of people. I love this quote here. It says, quote, nothing says how awesome your culture is than an 18-meter walking mech built upon four decades of Japanese fandom. It's in quote. So, so that is uh, that's a great uh, summary of it there. However, and this is the this is where it gets interesting. Not everyone thinks so. So there was all this Twitter nonsense about oh, this is just for children, and probably the most high profile <laughs> voice of this uh, thought was Matt Walsh from the Daily Wire, <laughs> who said, "quote This may be the most spectacular waste of money in human history." end quote. So, whoa, shots fired right there. And a few other people picked that up. I I didn't catch the name for this quote, but someone said, quote, really glad they figured out how to feed all the world's hungry children and made such a cool toy with extra money. Oh, wait, which end quote, which, oh, goodness. Shades of Judas Iscariot here. This giant Gundam could have (laughs) been sold and the money given to the poor. (laughs) I've heard similar comments on Twitter lately. Maybe this is just a moralistic fad that is especially prominent in the last few weeks. But yeah. the price tag or the the hypothesized price tag came out for the the Snyder Cut, uh, the ultimate version of you know the actual uh, director's vision for uh, DC's Justice League. Uh, that came out as about seventy million dollars, and a bunch of people who are Snyder haters started grumping about how much this could have funded COVID research. No one says that about anything else. Like, well, why are we suddenly saying that now as if money is just some resource floating out there in the void that can be redirected via magic to some kind of problem? And then you just put money toward the problem and you solve it. That is simply, speaking of childlike thinking, that is such childish thinking there. Yeah, and it, it kind of goes to this idea that art is optional or expendable or whatever, which uh, we, we, we can talk all, that could be a whole episode. The last uh, hot take I'll, I'll read off here, I think feeds pretty well into what we're going to talk about today. So this is from another guy on Twitter named Drew Holden, 
seems like a pretty well-known uh, commentator on, on politics and things. And he says, quote, a good reminder that cartoons are inappropriate for anyone but children. This is the sort of weird thing that well-adjusted people should age out of, end quote. So the one redeeming thing about Drew's quote here, hot take, is that at least he invited the inevitable ratio. You know, he, he got completely ratioed like five to one. Which is comments over likes. More people right. were pushing back in <laughs> arguments in the comments on Twitter rather than just hitting like on his comment and saying, rah, rah, you go and moving on. Oh, yeah. And, and he knew it was coming. And, uh, and, you know, so people obviously defended the awesomeness of this thing. But also, you know, the cultural significance to Japan saying, well, you know, are you complaining about Disney World while you're trashing this thing? And and also, you know, a lot of people went into the um, kind of the important themes of Gundam, which I, I won't get into, but it was very interesting to read more about what th- they were trying to say, you know, through the series. <laughs> and Drew Holden just kept doubling down and calling people, you know, losers, cartoon nerds, whatever. But the responses to him that I really, that I really noticed were were great. One was, you know, you're too, you're way too young to be such a grump. And here's the best one, Stephen. Someone said, you've never read or understood C.S. Lewis's essays on growth and labeling things as childish or adult, end quote. Hmm. Does that sound familiar? It completely does. Of course, one of Lewis's most famous quotes is, quote, when I was 10, I read fairy tales in secret and would have been ashamed if I had been found doing so. Now that I am 50, I I read them openly. When I became a man, I put away childish things, including the fear of childishness and the desire to be very grown up, end quote. And uh, the book that uh, we're discussing in our main segment today uh, is actually a collection of essays called Of Other Worlds, and it includes uh, several of Lewis's takes about children and writing and uh, particularly the, the, uh, the accusation in vogue of his time that the fairy tale is passe. It's, uh, it's, it's nursery furniture. It's not for anyone except the very immature. And Lewis's pushes back on that so strongly, uh, particularly saying, hey, you know, when you grow up, it's not so much that you are putting away the stuff that you enjoyed as a child, you are adding to them. He specifically says, why should I say that I don't like sleeping just because children do a lot of it. Uh, it's just, it's absurd. He says it, the logic breaks down when you push at it. And it does seem that the folks who are most eager to affirm how grown up they are, are protesting too much. And deep down, maybe they have a bit of a, an issue, maybe mm-hmm. an issue that they had while growing up as a child and just wanting to be grown up all the time. And then once you get there, uh, you actually act very juvenile in declaring how grown up you are and how immature everyone else is. Look, I'm putting my office together right now. I've got all my books on my bookshelves. I'm waiting for some other bookshelves to come in. And then I am putting up my massive action figure collection. (laughs) Lord of the Rings action figures, some superheroes, some anime characters. I I don't have a Gundam uh, figure, but if I ever got into that fandom, then I might. And it's perfectly acceptable. I I know I'm fairly confident that I'm uh, meeting all of the grown up uh, standards or trying to anyway that God would have for someone in my place in life. So why not then appreciate the artistry and the fun in something like a cartoon? And also anyone who just says that animation is just for kids uh, is just repeating a canard. That is a total canard. Uh, Animation is not a genre. It is a medium. It is a way of telling multiple different kinds of stories for multiple different kinds of fans. Well, and speaking of canard, that's kind of what we're uh, going through today. Uh, uh, a common belief people have taken in about what C.S. Lewis meant about using his imagination while he wrote Narnia and other books. And so where, where are we going with that? Why don't you give us an overview? Well, not long ago, we did a two-part series on the podcast called The Top Seven Myths About the Chronicles of Narnia. Uh, this is another myth. I wouldn't call it the eighth myth in that series, but it's more about the creation, not just of Narnia, but the ways that Christians approach the creation of stories. And first, though, uh, we would need to issue some some concessions about that, because the issue is whether Lewis meant Narnia to teach children valuable lessons using the means of the fairy tale, or did Lewis just ignore the idea of teaching children valuable lessons and, and just go forth with the images and the imagination, and then that's all he ever did. And then by application, any Christian who wants to make a story now 
uh, should just use their imagination and then not worry about letting the Christianity get in there. If, if it gets in there, it'll get in there by accident. You shouldn't have to try. This is not how we write books. So first, I've got a few uh, sweet concessions uh, from uh, the, the autumn festival here, uh, fresh from the concession stand. Uh, really quick here. The first one here is that this, this is not a response to anyone in particular. Now, I tend to get about in a lot of circles where Christians are talking about creativity and fantasy. This is just part of what I do. So I do see this a lot. And this quote that we're going to get into, I see this a lot. And I suspect that I may have used this quote from Lewis out of context myself. And that's not wrong, but I might say that it is a it is a bit of a meme if we are spreading it about apart from the context of Lewis's original essay, which I, I read. Uh, if not reading, I don't think I've read this for the first time recently, but this is the first time when I read it and then something clicked and I realized, oh, I think we might be missing something here if we're if we're sharing this phrase or this paragraph from this this full body of work here. Second concession, uh, th this uh, this anything we say here does not enable uh, the idea that you just go out and very seriously want to make a Sunday school lesson for children. And then, oh, if the little tykes are all into the cartoons or the fairy tales, uh, then I guess we have to use that. You know, we need to dip the peas in syrup uh, in order to make them eat their peas. And they'll taste the sweetness at first. And then once, uh, once the sweetness wears off, too late, they've been eating their peas, but at least they got their vitamins and we got down without too much of a fight. So we're not, uh, we're not, uh, supporting this kind of dull view of creativity. We still do critique that. We need a place for both imagination and truth. Uh, and finally, concession number three, this is not all about authors. Every person listening to this podcast is a creative person. Andrew Peterson, in a recent book, leaned very hard on this idea that there's no such thing as a divide between a creative, the noun, and someone who is not creative. God has made every person in his own image. Every person is therefore able to create something. And even if you've never tried to write a fantasy story and have just enjoyed, enjoyed reading one or watching one, uh, this applies in how we understand why and how these stories are put together. I have heard a similar idea. This is actually a quote from something I read where someone said, you know, the packaging doesn't matter, only the contents speaking specifically to Christians in the arts. So maybe Oh, that's that's Gnosticism ultimately. Books. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a Gnostic idea that only the wrapper doesn't matter. You just throw it away. The body doesn't matter, only the soul inside. Uh, <laughs> no, form has meaning. And this is why God has given us the Bible in the way that he did. It's not just the the content, the mystical interior, but the exterior that matters just as much. Yeah, and I wonder if these would be the same people that say, "Oh, don't judge a book by its cover," which you know is generally good advice. But at the same time, like uh, books these days have you know really cool covers. I mean, your book, Stephen, is a beautiful cover, and it's just it's becoming more and more of a fun trend to see you know the cover reveal. Here's what the cover of this upcoming book is going to look like, and you know I I think because we're drawn to beautiful things, we're drawn to art. For its own sake, like beauty is an irreducible value, as my friend John Biddle would say, it, it doesn't have to be justified. It doesn't have to be subservient to truth or goodness. It is its own value. Okay. So Amen. I won't get on my soapbox there too much. Oh, please do. <laughs> yeah, Zach, you mentioned the cover for The Pop Culture Parent, uh, which is my first book, along with uh, Ted Turneau and Jared Moore, Helping Kids Engage Their World for Christ. Uh, it's nonfiction, and when we were designing the cover, it's important to let a book cover give you the idea, into your, put it into your imagination, the idea of the type of book. You know, you're already selling something, you're already communicating something by what you see before you even see the words. And I think one of the words I used in the design brief was kaleidoscope. That popular mm -hmm. culture is this mess of images and they're spiraling around and it's difficult to sort one from the other. And someone maybe hit on that word or whatever word I used that was similar to it. And that's the cover that you see now. I mean, it, it looks like kind of this grid of panels, each one showing either a, a clearly uh, obvious uh, image of popular culture, you know, like a little dragon or a little game controller. And then others are a little bit more abstract. So it, it communicates at once the type of story that you're getting. It's important for that outside to match the inside. So we're not critiquing the idea of imagination for sure. We're not saying imagination doesn't matter. You should only teach moral lessons. But I want to acknowledge that as we proceed, 
it may sound a little like that because this is just meant to be a little bit of a push in the direction of, yes, we're not just imaginative people. We are also truth speaking people. If we are Christians, we have both of those roles in our lives. So we're diving into C.S. Lewis's Of Other Worlds, but what specifically in there are we, we going to look at today? It's his essay, Sometimes Fairy Stories May Say Best What's to Be Said. Uh, you may have access to this essay if you Google a phrase from it. Uh, I suggest the very memorable phrase, pure moonshine, uh, which Lewis does not mean in a complimentary way. Or just Google that and C.S. Lewis, and you can probably find this essay out there. don't know if that's legally printed on the websites, but it's a fairly short article. Very readable, I feel, and my copy is in a, in a paperback called Of Other Worlds, Essays and Short Stories. And usually when Christians are quoting from this essay, the, the main quote is the one about the pure moonshine, and we find it in isolation from the rest of the essay. Okay, yeah, here I got it pulled up. It says, quote, Some people seem to think that I began by asking myself how I could say something about Christianity to children, then fixed on the fairy tale as an instrument, then collected information about child psychology and decided what age group I'd write for, drew up a list of basic Christian truths and hammered out allegories to embody them. This is all pure moonshine. I couldn't write in that way at all. Everything began with images, a fawn carrying an umbrella, a queen on a sledge, a magnificent lion. At first, there wasn't even anything Christian about them. That element pushed itself in of its own accord. End quote. And so, by the way, C.S. Lewis is talking about Narnia here and how he started writing the line, The Witch in the Wardrobe. Uh, Stephen, I feel like we've read this quote on another episode. I, I'm, I've heard this many, many times, and I, I feel like we've talked about it at some extent. <laughs> I, I can already see the, the kinds of things people build up around this quote. Oh, when you pull it out all by itself, there are many uh, misinterpretations that can result here. But I think it's important even to note about this quote in isolation, Lewis is being very gently snarky about what he supposes others suppose about his creative process. And you can just see a bunch of men in suits with beards, you know, in the 40s or 50s sitting around a boardroom and there's a cross on the wall and maybe the logo of the ministry. And they say to one another, gentlemen, we must say something about Christianity to children. What can we do? And then the other one says, sir, fairy tales are very popular these days, sir. And the other one says, brilliant Johnson, but aren't fairy tales for children. And then Johnson says, well, that doesn't matter, sir. We're trying to reach children. And then they all get together in hushed tones and split apart and do subcommittees and collect information about child psychology. And then they hire a ghostwriter, you know, and then put the name of the pastor on the book instead. And then maybe mention the ghostwriter in the acknowledgments on the inside. And I'm being a little snarky too, but that is kind of the professional Christian ministry uh, idea is that everything needs to be bureaucratized to this extent. And Lewis is saying, no, that's not how I write. You know, Lewis, being familiar with maybe the more academical side of this, says, you know, as if speaking uh, as a resident of a foreign land, says, no, this is how we do it in, in my country. It starts with images. This is part of the bubbling. Lewis describes this kind of like this frothing mixture of imagination that hasn't been put to form yet, but um, he has to spell it out here you know, giving that bubbling idea form and using images like moonshine and some of this gentle snark that he has. Uh, he's responding to the notion that he always intended to write some teaching tool. That he wanted always to say something about Christianity to children. And this is a bit of a corrective to ministries that are overly focused on such pragmatism, you know, this tool-based approach. We've got a problem. Let's find a tool to fix it. But, Zach, I think some people, some well-meaning Christians, especially those who have grown up with this uh, pragmatism, this teaching tool philosophy, people can take this quote too far. Uh, they reject the very genuine Christian emphasis in Narnia. They say things like, well, Lewis didn't try to insert Christianity into his stories. It just got in there by accident. And we shouldn't do that either. You know, If we're writing stories or sharing stories, we shouldn't worry about whether or not they have Christian ideas. Just enjoy the images. Just enjoy the imagination. Uh, we need creative freedom after all. Uh, we need imagination and no, no teaching. No, none of this Sunday school stuff. We don't need that. 
But if you read the rest of Lewis's quote, as we'll do in a moment, uh, not reading the whole essay, but putting it into its original context, you actually see that this here that Lewis is describing is but one stage and one part of his identity, one stage of his creative process and only one part of his uh, identity as a Christian creator, as a Christian author. I think there is some truth to that even too. It's like if you start with this message you want to hit people over the head with, yeah, it's going to make for a bad story. And so, yeah, by saying, well, he didn't try to insert Christianity. Well, <laughs> we'll see if that's true or not. But I I definitely agree with you shouldn't try to force a teaching. Um, you shouldn't start with the message and then build everything around that. Because it doesn't matter who does that, whether it's a Christian or a, a secular writer. You, you have a message-driven fiction. It, it's no longer fiction. It's just a message. It, it doesn't really work that way. But, you know, Stephen, my mind immediately went to the movie Elf with Will Ferrell, where they bring in this... Um, Ghostwriter, I guess, Miles Finch. Well, I guess he wasn't a ghostwriter, but you know, he's he's the guy played by Peter Dinklage. And he's he comes in, he has all these demands, and he's like, okay, farm vegetables are really hot right now. Yeah, that's all the craze. So let's let's we gotta make a story about farm vegetables. <laughs> I don't know if that was reg, uh referencing veggie tales or something, but I, I think it was. But you know, it's that imagery of like there's a boardroom. You know, guys in suits saying, okay, how are we going to reach the kids? You know, th this is what the kids like. Let's just start with that. And then we'll say whatever we want to say through that. So yeah, it's, it's funny how that's even been mocked in popular culture, but yeah. So I, I think you're right in that the, not only is what C.S. Lewis addressing pure moonshine, but even the way that we respond to it is pure moonshine. So, I, so you, you said, even within this quote, you, you see how this mythology we've built up around this starts to unravel. So tell me more about that. Absolutely. It's right there in that last sentence of this portion that's usually excerpted all on its own. He says, quote, at first, there wasn't even uh. anything Christian about them, end quote. At first, Lewis is already hinting that he's, yes, the Chronicles of Narnia do have something Christian about them. The Chronicles of Narnia are Christian fiction. They are Christian fantasy. And that goes back to my point is that this is just Lewis describing one part, the initial start of his creative process. It starts with the images, but it does not finish there. The context of the essay reveals that. And you can see if you read the whole thing that first Lewis didn't limit the essay just to talking about how and here's how I made Narnia behind the scenes. He's just using an example of his creation of Narnia for his main point. And his main point is that he arrived at fantasy as a form for expressing these ideas, but these ideas started with images. And he is speaking of three creative uh, overlapping states of being a, a creative person. It's not just the first one, not just the, someone sitting around using their imagination. In order, Lewis speaks of his role as one, the author, two, the form, and three, the man. And the man is probably the most important part for, for my main point here. Uh, the author is the one who's coming up with the bubbling of the images, you know, these random images like the fawn in the woods and the queen on the sleigh. And then, the, you know, maybe the lion bounding in. The form is what connects the author to the man because the form is referenced right there in the title. Sometimes fantasy stories may say best what's to be said. What's to be said are the images that Lewis had and fantasy or fairy stories is the form that gives them life. It's the, it's the wrapping, as it were, the, the medium to communicate the ideas, but it is just as important. And Lewis describes more, and we'll, we'll get to that in step two here. But Lewis starts with uh, number one in his identity as a creative person. He calls it the author. Uh, Lewis starts off his essay by saying uh, he's not going to talk about, quote, the Renaissance ideas of pleasing and instructing, end quote, which I think is a reference to the idea of what are, what are stories or what is art meant to do? Is it supposed to entertain? Is it purely recreational? Uh, or is it a practical tool for teaching? Uh, Lewis says he's not addressing this dichotomy. He's, instead, he says, quote, All I want to use is the distinction between the author as author and the author as man, citizen, or Christian. What this comes to for me is that there are usually two reasons for writing unimaginative work which may be called author's reason and the man's. 
If only one of these is present, then so far as I am concerned, the book will not be written. If the first is lacking, it can't. If the second is lacking, it shouldn't. End quote. So to paraphrase that there at the last, if the first reason, the author's reason, the, the creativity, the imagination, if, that, if you don't have that first reason, the book cannot be written, it can't even get started. But he's very clear that if you don't have the man's reason, and he's clarifying man as citizen or Christian, if you don't have a Christian reason to write a book, it shouldn't be written. So Lewis is pretty clear. He does want Christian creators to think as Christians. He doesn't want authors uh, to just be creative and use imagination, but he wants them also to be thinking about their work as good, godly Christians. And from here in the essay, he's talking about the process of being the author, how the story starts, the inspiration, the images, the use of imagination. He speaks of what he calls the bubbling, which is this uh, disorganized array of ideas and pictures that just come into the imagination at random and then drag at the heart until you have to do something about them. Lewis says this is almost like being in love. But only then does Lewis break and say, okay, this is how it's worked for me. And then he gives the example of the images uh, that led to his creation of the Chronicles of Narnia. But we cannot stop there. Lewis, at least, doesn't stop there. He doesn't say that the story making begins and ends with the images. First, or second, rather, you take the images and you have to give them the form. The form is what organizes the images uh, before the man gives them purpose. And we'll uh, discuss the form and the man next. Okay, so this is all very interesting to me, and, I, and I'm going to put on my writer hat, and that's why I introduced myself as a Christian who writes science fiction. So I started this uh, short story, golly, about um, maybe four years, maybe three years ago, and it all starts, so I was, I was laying down with one of my daughters, putting her to bed, and I was about to fall asleep, and this image just out of nowhere popped in my mind. And it was basically this um, uh, black box recording from a spaceship, like a distress call, but that's discovered later. And it just started, it started with someone saying, if you're watching this, then I'm already dead. And it, it, again, it just came out of nowhere. And I thought, yeah, that's I a good hook right that it is. Yeah. Yeah. So I woke right up and I'm like, all right, I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to go write all that down. And I wrote like a 3000 word story uh, just from that opening line that, that came out of quote nowhere. And much later. I realized, oh my goodness, this needs to be a central part of this novel that I'm writing, like a, a this 400 page novel that I'm writing. And so I, I had to kind of figure out how to work that in and how to, you know, make the story fit with that. And, uh, but my, my point here is that I used to have, this is the first novel I've ever written, the one I'm currently writing. And I used to have this idea, Stephen, that images and, and stories would just come to me out of nowhere that it would just uh, be like this, this random thing that just takes over this inspiration. And I don't really have a choice in it. And I, I don't really have to do anything. I just have to wait around for it and, and it will come in. And you know, that's partly true. Th this idea of this black box from a spaceship that, that really did just come out of nowhere. Although thinking about it, I, I really like stories with that that with that element. And I can think of oblivion. I could think of uh, more recently frozen Two, involve that very crucially in the story. But in, in terms of this image, it, yeah, it, it did just come out of my imagination. Just the, the like you said, the bubbling, but <laughs> it's all the work I had to do after that, that required, you know, logic that required work <laughs> that required a lot of editing. Right. That's, that, that's the form. Yes. Yeah. So I, I think it, it's funny. It's like we, we, both of these things are true. You know, you, you, you do get these inspirations. You don't know where they come from, but that doesn't create a story on, all on its own. And so, you know, you, you need both parts of your brain. In other words, not just a right brain or a left brain thing. Right. And we're not even talking about editing and other people reading the story and giving feedback, you know, with a perspective outside of your own, which requires a lot more of that colloquial left brain use. You know, I think actually that idea has been discredited. Your brain is a lot more complex than that, but we can still use the metaphor. You know, right brain is the, is the creative, you know, just wants to, uh, to, to have, have her lead and then uh, not deal with some of the more logical objections. And then left brain, 
And the same person comes along and says, now, wait a minute, you know, this doesn't make any sense. And if you want to communicate this story to others in service to them, then you need to cut this or add that or revise this over here. Lewis is very clear that uh, this, this is what he calls the form. And everyone has to give, if you want to give, you know, have your images, the imagination go anywhere, uh, then you have to give it the form. Uh, I noted, uh, Zach, while you were saying that, it made me realize this, this is not a thought from Lewis, uh, but from uh, myself, is that without other people giving form to their images, organizing them, editing them, putting them into the constraints of a particular genre, uh, you would have not had even the ability to have the idea of a black box that does this. Because what mm -hmm. forms were you drawing upon to have that image? Uh, as a community of human beings, we are all uh, limited by our own forms, but the form gives freedom. Other people disciplined themselves, uh, either in stories about a, a plane crash or a suspense thriller or something like that. And as a result, you were able to have that imagination. And then if you give form to that, then that can help inspire someone else and so on and so forth. When I first wrote that little short story about the black box, you know, the, the overall purpose I had in even wanting to write something was, you know, I love science fiction, but sometimes quite often, if there is a, a person of faith, like a Christian character, they're not always represented very accurately or very well or very positively. So I want to change that. I, I want to imagine a future that will be more likely to exist where Christians go out on spaceships you know, because that is in some ways the most fantastical part of Star Trek is that it's a future without any religion. You know, it's like John Lennon's uh, utopia come true, I guess. But I just think that's, that's hogwash. Like there's always going to be dedicated Christians in, in any sphere of society because that's how it's been for 2000 years. Okay. And that was my main purpose was just like, Oh, I want to, I want to put a Christian in a great science fiction story. And I also want to elevate certain values and things that don't really get elevated by a lot of stories. And, and namely like the family, like the, 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 yes, the nuclear family, it's not always treated very well. And sometimes that's, I don't mean like stories like say, Oh, the family is terrible, but a lot of stories exist because the family has been broken apart. Um, by sin or by, you know, evil or, or something, or, or a person just has a terrible parent or something. And I, I, I didn't really want to approach it that way. I wanted to start with a solid family at the core of a story. So kind of like, I think Lost in Space actually does this pretty well. But, uh, but again, that's kind of the exception for, for a lot of science fiction. So anyway, right. I, I see what Lewis is saying is that you, you have that kind of mission in a sense to begin with. All right. Well, you, you've actually sneak previewed uh, what Lewis would call uh, step three or stage three, you know, the identity of the man, you know, where, where does the purpose come in? Once you've started with the images and then gone to form, you know, wh where does the, the larger point of the story, you know, if you're thinking about it as a good citizen or a good Christian, uh, but first, uh, you know, we can't get there without going through uh, the form because uh, you, you found the form in your case, uh, which is more something like science fiction. Lewis says of the initial outpouring of images and ideas uh, in his essay, quote, this ferment leads to nothing unless it is accompanied with a longing for a form, verse or prose, short story, novel, play, or whatnot. When these two things click, you have the author's impulse complete, end quote. And in Lewis's case, of course, uh, he said uh, that the fairy tale was a perfect form for what's to be said. You know, the images, the fawn, the lion, the witch, the snowy wood. He said, quote, as these images sorted themselves into events, i.e. became a story, they seemed to demand no love interest and no close psychology. But the form which excludes these things is the fairy tale. And the moment I thought of that, I fell in love with the form itself. Its brevity, its severe restraints on description, its flexible traditionalism. It's inflexible hostility to all anal analysis, digression, reflections, and gas. <laughs> the fairy tale seemed the ideal form for the stuff I had to say. End quote. Uh, there's, a, there's an ellipsis there right before that last sentence. 
uh, just to keep things a little bit brief here. Uh, speaking of brevity, I love how Lewis describes the form of the fairy tale. And if you're familiar with the Chronicles of Narnia, then all of those things he listed apply as attributes to all seven of the Chronicles. And even the flexible traditionalism, I just, I love that turn of phrase right there. Now, if a creator kept uh, some sense of absolute freedom just with the images, then, okay, that's fine. That's not a sin. You just play around with the image and it doesn't go anywhere, but you couldn't call that a story proper. There wouldn't be a story. Uh, this is where the form, uh, in a sense, disciplines our imagination so we can share the story. We can serve others with the images that we've had. Now, the image is like a raw mineral that we dig up out of the earth. The form is what polishes the image and gives it its shine. Uh, this is not Lewis. Uh, it's me, me kind of trying to spin off of here. This is a very biblical idea, you know, even back in the Garden of Eden, God gives Adam and Eve the garden to tend. They're taming the garden. They're acting as good stewards. They're going to put in one plant and then keep out other plants. They're going to say this tree grows here and we're going to have this little corner over here where this other tree grows. We classify the animals and then eventually we build cities, which involves even more organization. This is God glorifying stuff. And then earlier, Zach, where we were talking about this idea that, you know, the, the story is just the wrapper. The only good thing is the truth that's inside. Uh, no, uh, if God thought that way, then we wouldn't be here. God would be off in, uh, in heaven saying, OK, I've got this idea, this uh, platonic ideal of some creature that would kind of reflect my image back to me. But I'm just going to sit here all three in one like I am and not do anything about it. Instead, God himself gave this idea form and we are the forms and we ought to live in gratitude that God didn't just sit there by himself, but uh, actually wanted to share this authorial impulse with the rest of us. So the term that comes to my mind is genre conventions. If you're a writer, you really want to study the expectations, the, the typical way that a certain genre plays out. And I think Lewis he really understood the fairy tale genre. You know, all these things you mentioned, it's, it's brief, um, not tons of description. <laughs> well, well, we can get into that, with the, you know, with the epic fantasy kind of genre. Well, the fairy tale, as Lewis is describing, is, is short form storytelling, you know? Oh, it's that's like, true. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the sh the, obviously, a Narnia story is, is more like a short novel, and it's not a, a fairy story like Hansel and Gretel, you know, that might be over inside of 20 pages. And that's where I think Lewis appeals to the flexible traditionalism. Like there's, there's some room to play with it, but there are still expectations that have built up around the genre. Anytime you say fairy tale, you expect certain things. Yeah. And it's funny, you know, that he says the inflexible hostility to all analysis, digression, reflections, and gas, like that is, uh, <laughs> that's always the soup du jour. Like let's deconstruct this book and, you know, find everything problematic in it, which, uh, I don't really care for that. I think it's fine to think about it and analyze it and whatever, but I don't know, lighten up people. <laughs> well, I, I want to, speaking of light, I, I want to look up what Lewis means by gas here, but I've read enough Lewis to kind of get the idea that baloney. at least here, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's baloney, it's bloviation, it's just a bunch of, you know, stuffy, big jowled men, you know, sitting around in yeah. suits with their pipes, uh, making small talk that they think is very big. Well, in the way that Lewis wrote Narnia, okay, it, it's in a, I, I guess you could say it's not a very popular approach to point of view. So he uses the omniscient narrator point of view, where it's, it's basically like the storyteller is the focus of the book in a sense, like, like you are hearing almost directly from Lewis himself tell you about the story. And I think it works. It, it's similar to how a, a father reads a story to a child. It, it's meant to be, you know, kind of this family campfire story in a sense. Again, it, it's the whole like lighten up everyone. <laughs> like Lewis is not making this like serious point about everything. I mean, we, I think we've covered that pretty well. You know, Stephen, I, I think how he approached these, the genre convention shows a lot of wisdom. Because one thing I see today a lot is creators that want to, and authors that want to subvert genre expectations. Uh, you know, I'm going to go there. The last Jedi is probably the most prominent example of this, of, of a writer that's like, you know what? I know what people expect and I hate what they expect. So I'm going to give them something completely different 
because I think they're dumb and they're wrong for expecting those things. And so, you know, everything gets flipped around in its head and, you know, basically heroism is stupid and okay. That, that's all I want to say about the last Jedi. But well, at least, I mean, we don't know whether or not he hated the genre. I mean, technically I may get myself in trouble with some and even while I'm being praised <laughs> by last Jedi defenders, but the point being is that it certainly comes across as if let's just name him, name him, uh, Rian Johnson, uh, wanted to be different for the sake of being different. If you right. overthrow or subvert the genre, then you need to have a good reason for that. And the reason is more like the, the purpose. Uh, you, what, what is it that you're hoping to reveal about humanity uh, or the, uh, the nature of this genre that can only be done by some kind of acts of subversion? Can you subvert the genre while offering something that everyone's going to sit up straight and go, whoa, that's actually better, or that's really different, but in a good way, or even just a challenging way. If you're just subverting it for the sake of subverting it, then I, either you're just going to be goofy, you're, you're going to be a parody, uh, which is why a lot of people react very poorly to you know Luke Skywalker moping around on his ancient planet and you know drinking green milk and all of that stuff. But people just <laughs> laugh because they don't know what else to do. It's so awkward. Or you can subvert for a better reason. And that, you know, that's, that's part of, I think you're still kind of sticking with the form there because at least you understand the form and respect it even while you're trying to subvert it. I think it comes down to, are you trying to fix the genre? This is something uh, Thomas Umstadt on the Christian Publishing Show, great friend of ours, he, he says all the time, like, don't try to fix the genre and, and just say, oh, well, you know, I want to write a science fiction, but I, I think science fiction is dumb and so I'm going to fix it. Readers aren't going to like that. They, they like the genre for certain reasons. So you got to understand those reasons. And I think it's fine to expand on it. And yes, it's okay to be surprising and maybe a little subversive. But it's like I said, with my own subversive thing with writing science fiction is I'm showing a future as I think it will actually exist with religious people in it. And I don't think that's unrealistic. I think it's more unrealistic that everyone's an atheist in most science fiction in the future. But again, that's like, I'm, I don't even think that's a central trope to science fiction. I just think it's a funny thing about it. So I, I'm, I'm just expanding in a way I'm, I'm saying, Hey, I love science fiction, but I think we've left some people out of these stories. So let's, let's try to bring them in. Lewis also subverts expectations in, in the way that he wrote the Chronicles of Narnia. For one thing, they are, they are longer form uh, stories. If you, most people I think would think of a fairy story as something fairly short pun unintended there uh lewis has seven stories with pretty much continuity all across them i think that's fairly different for the genre so again lewis expanding on it not uh, not overthrowing it but the expansions and you know, whatever new things that he brought to the genre were probably there because of lewis's third and final uh, overlapping stage of his creative process, which also subverts some Christians' expectations that they just want Narnia to be fun fantasy that just happens to be Christian. No, the surprising part in this essay is, is that Lewis does believe in getting the message in there by intention. This is very important, and it is an, a truth that we often ignore whenever we talk about Lewis's creative process and the Chronicles of Narnia. I, I suspect it's uh, it, it maybe a little less comfortable for Christians who come from that background of the Sunday school, school marm, you know, rapping on your knuckles with a ruler and telling you to stop drawing dragons and pay attention in class when we're talking about Leviticus. And as a result, you may think, oh, I really want some creative freedom here. Really want some creative freedom. Trust me, though, I think Lewis discovered that the best kind of freedom does come from not just playing around with the images, but giving them form and then giving them purpose as the Christian person. Of course, you know, Lewis saying, you know, the man, he's talking about himself and, you know, man generally, it applies just as much to women for sure. Remember we said earlier, Lewis said, quote, at first there wasn't even anything Christian about them. Uh, that is his images, end quote. Emphasis on at first. Lewis eventually did get something Christian into those images. The image eventually did become Christian. Uh, remember when Lewis talked about uh, the man as a citizen and as a Christian? Well, then he goes to describe himself as an example. Again, first the author with the images, uh, then leading to the form, and then the role of the man. 
capitalized the man. And here's his quote, the rest of it in, begin quote. Then of course, the man in me began to have his turn. I thought I saw how stories of this kind could steal past a certain inhibition which had paralyzed much of my own religion and childhood. Why did one find it so hard to feel, as one was told one ought to feel about God or about the sufferings of Christ? I thought the chief reason was that one was told one ought to. An obligation to feel can freeze feelings, and reverence itself did harm. The whole subject was associated with lowered voices, almost as if it were something medical. But supposing that by casting all these things into an imaginary world, stripping them of their stained glass and Sunday school associations, one could make them for the first time appear in their real potency. Could one not thus steal past those watchful dragons? I thought one could. End quote. So Lewis has given form to his initial bubbling of images, and now he gives it purpose. Doesn't just let it happen by accident. He means to make it happen. He thinks about it. He thinks, wait a minute. I used to think this way about Jesus when people were telling me that I had to feel sad about his suffering. Could a story like this help to bypass that, uh, that reaction that I have to being told to feel certain ways about the gospel? He says, quote, that was the man's motive. But of course, he could have done nothing if the author had not been on the boil first. End quote. Yes, Virginia Lewis did want to create stories to teach something about Christianity to children. It was not where he started, but it was where he ended. You can affirm that. You can rejoice in that. And you can learn from that while you still reject the idea of starting with the very valuable lessons we want to teach. You don't start that with the Sunday school associations that Lewis is talking about, but you do eventually want to go back to there. It just starts with the imagination that God has given and then leads in the direction of those biblical truths that you want to communicate in a different way. A story starts with the image bubbling, then goes to the form, but it doesn't end there. And Zach, you like that quote from uh, Emily Dickinson, uh, where uh, it is, she is saying, uh, tell, yeah, the tell, truth, all the truth, tell the truth, tell it slant. slant. Exactly. Lewis did mean to tell the truth. Uh, he wanted to say something about Christianity to children. It's right there in the title of the essay, What's to be Said? But he started with those images, just as we should. And I think Christian creators need to uh, rejoice in the gift of imagination, but not uh, split that off split the uh, creative personality. I'm just going to go over here and play with my images now, uh, Monday through Saturday, but then on Sunday, you know, I'm going to go to church uh, and be a good gospel Christian. It is all the same person, all the same life. You can't split them apart. Uh, and the Christian creative, I think, does need to be intentional. Eventually, after you start giving form to those images, then they need to have a purpose. What does the story intend to do? Uh, what is the what is the service that you're going to give to readers, whether or not they're Christians? This was Lewis's approach. I think it needs to be the approach, the conscious approach of many more Christian creators. So this is definitely something I'm working through with my own novel, is that, again, I started with this idea of a black box. If you're watching this, I'm already dead. And then it was it was just that. It was this whole message, and it's about this you know very science fiction-y uh, story. And then I created this much larger story that's wrapped around that message. It, it's just like what Lewis said at first, there wasn't anything Christian about it. It's just this important message that need needs to get to someone. And then I started thinking, okay, who are the people delivering or hearing this message? Like, how is their faith a part of this? And, you know, it's something that I've, I'm wanting to show more than just have Christians talking about being Christians. Like it, it's, I wanted to show how their faith operates in the midst of this science fiction universe, uh, because I definitely take Lewis's point to heart. You know, how can you steal past those watchful dragons? People uh, get very suspicious <laughs> when there's any mention of faith or religion or Christians or whatever in stories. I mean, I think about Man of Steel, where he he visits the the priest. And oh man, that that really got people on edge. Like, oh, what's going to happen with this? And I thought it was a great scene, but again, it was people who got you know they really sat up straight. Like, what's going to be what's going to be said here? Is this going to get all preachy? And so he's he's absolutely right. This phrase, watchful dragons, 
the way uh, Emily Dickinson said it is so great that tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Uh, she says, you know, it's, it's success in circuit lies too bright for infirm delight. The truth's superb surprise. Don't, don't be so on the nose with it. Like make it kind of sneak it in, in a way which, yeah, which again, I really wrestled with this for a while, Stephen. I'm like, well, if I want to just say a Christian truth, why, you know, why, why be sneaky about it? You know, wh- why try to go in through the side door? Why not go in through the front door? It's and not it's, sneaky. Uh, it's superb surprise. It's, surpri- yeah. I mean, is a super, if you're setting up a surprise, are you being sneaky? Yes. But in a good way, it's, it's the, it's the moral side on that spectrum. If you're hiding something, it's not being deceptive. You're just setting right. up a surprise. Right. Well, and at the end of this poem, the truth must dazzle gradually or every man be blind. And and I think that's really how it is. You know, okay. When, when Jesus preached, he, he did preach directly, but he also spent plenty of time. He spent years <laughs> with, with people preaching the gospel because it took people a long time. Even his disciples took them a long time to understand it. To borrow a phrase from my friend, Cody, don't feel like you have to back up the dump truck of truth and just dump it all at once on someone. You know, it, it can come through little pieces. It, it's a tactical decision. It, it's don't have this temptation like, Oh, this is my only chance to say everything I've wanted to say. You know, it can just come in little snippets. And so in the revisions I'm doing in my book, that's something I'm, I'm paying very close attention to because again, I realized that, it's like there's these proximity sensors that go off in people's minds when, when too much spirituality happens. And I, and I see this even in secular books that are not written by Christian authors. People go like, okay, when am I going to get past this scene with the priest or whatever? So you, you have to realize how people are. And even as a Christian, when I, when I read or watch things by Christian creators, I'm a little bit on guard sometimes. Cause I'm like, are, are you trying to, teach me something. But again, I don't think it's wrong to want to teach something. I think it just comes down into the how. Exactly. Well, a few episodes ago, we talked about uh, the biblical drama series, The Chosen, which is one of my go-to prime examples now for this type of thinking. Do the creators, especially the show creator, Dallas Jenkins, want to say something about Jesus to viewers? Absolutely. The show is literally about Jesus and his (laughs) followers. The people who knew him best, their mission is right there up front, hidden in plain sight. Yes, Jesus was real. We would like you to get to know him. Here is a fictional portrayal of the Messiah. Uh, Here's how it could have happened with a lot of biblical fiction alongside the real life retellings of the gospel narrative. But they're not trying to pretend, oh, we're just uh, presenting some images. We're just enjoying. We're just here on a a romp. Uh, You know, why don't you come along with us? No, their purpose is right up front, but they're also doing it very well, the form that they've settled on is that of the streaming uh, dramatic series. And then, you know, the purpose of the man that they have is obviously, you know, to uphold the man, the God man, the son of man, Jesus Christ. It's right there. And fans love it anyway. You know, even a lot of non-Christian fans are totally on board with The Chosen just because it's done so well. The form that they've chosen fits with what they're trying to say, and it fits with their purpose of making the story in the first place. And stories like that, I think, can inspire uh, Christian fans who are looking for just that type of story, because as Christian readers of these kinds of stories, that uh, we do want to learn. And we don't want just to have a lark as we're enjoying these stories. Uh, recreation is a biblical idea. We want to grow. We want to be recreated, uh, being conformed to the image of Christ and having our mind and imagination be transformed. So Knowing these principles, I think we can find the better kinds of stories, especially if we're listening to the authors. Are they going on and on about how just this is just a fun story? And okay, I'm not really, it's not a Christian story. It's just a story that happens to be written by a Christian. Are they apologizing all the time? I think that says something about where they're coming from and whether or not we're going to enjoy their story. I think authors who are Christians need to quit apologizing about making stories with and alongside a Christian purpose. If you're a Christian writer, you're not just an author who's giving your stories forms. You're also a human being. And as a human, you are a new person in Christ. And your story aligns with your purpose in Christ. If you try to start with that purpose, you know, everything needs to be Christian. Yes, the story could go wrong. 
you're starting too late, especially if you're understanding or that the story has to fulfill the Great Commission and behave like a pastor giving a revival altar call or something. No, start early before you're reflecting the pastor or the evangelist. You're reflecting God. You're reflecting Christ. And the story would go wrong, though, if you just try to image it, uh, limit it to just the images and the form. To reference and clarify Lewis's quote near the beginning of the essay, uh, we'll actually put this in the show notes, of course. All these quotes will be in the show notes. With this version, I've added a few brackets in there for clarity. Quote, there are usually two reasons for writing an imaginative work, which may be called author's reason and the man's reason. If only one of these reasons is present, then so far as I am concerned, the book will not be written. If the first reason is lacking, it can't be written. If the second reason is lacking, it shouldn't be written. End quote. Lewis seems pretty clear there. If you don't have the identity or purpose of the man, that is the, the Christian, the human citizen in God's kingdom, then the book shouldn't be written. That's pretty bold. So if an author says, I'm a Christian author, or I'm an author who happens to be Christian or whatever you're comfortable saying, of course, you're always going to start with the images. But if an author says, oh, I'm just a Christian who writes and it's just about the imagination and I don't really have any higher purpose, I think that we do need to have a higher purpose. The purpose needs to be in there. Finish with that purpose included at the latter stages of the creative process. We must enjoy both identities. We're reflecting our own author and the man, Jesus Christ. Yeah, so if we go back to what I said in the beginning, I'm a Christian that writes science fiction. I think that stops too short, like what you're saying. So so I've thought about it now with everything we've said. I think a better way to describe myself is I'm a Christian who writes science fiction that explores the deep needs of the human soul. Like that's what I'm I'm all about that. I'm I'm all I'm all about science fiction that really gets into the human drama, that gets into what is beautiful and broken about humanity, what, what a humans ultimately need. And, you know, you can show a lot of that through science fiction, which is what's so beautiful about it. And yes, I'm a Christian. I don't apologize for that. I, I say it everywhere. That that's who I am. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm writing a story with Christian characters in a science fiction world. So of course their faith is going to be a part of what they do, but I am trying to write a story that anyone could pick up and read. It's not just for Christians, you know? So if we go back to one of our really early episodes about the concentric circles of Christian fiction, you know, I'm trying to write a story for a wider audience, but that is unapologetic and that there are Christians in it. Again, it's not, it's not a story though, in that, like that central part of the bullseye, like this is a story about Christianity itself. Like it's not a, I don't know, like, um, like a directly evangelistic you know, kind of story. Maybe I'll write a story like that. But that's not currently what I'm working on. But I, again, I, I don't think that's the only way to tell a story as a Christian. But Stephen, you said something really good here earlier, which is that I, I think a lot of people fool themselves into thinking, oh, I can just have fun with the story and not be intentional about what I say. I don't have to say anything about, you know, my faith or whatever. But I think the reality is we're always saying something about what we believe, you know, because we're either going to write a story where good or evil triumphs, you know, where there is purpose or there is not to what people do, where there are consequences or there are not, where either courage or cowardice wins the day. So ultimately we are saying something about what we believe just by the resolution of a story. So I say, just be honest or more so just be intentional you're going to make a statement. So you might as well know what it is. And sometimes you discover it. Like I, um, I had someone read through something I'd written and I said, what do you think the theme is? And he told me, and I thought, Oh, you're right. And I, I didn't think about that as intentionally as I could have. And now that I see that more clearly, I can, as I revise this, I can kind of weave that theme in a little bit better, but we're always saying something. So we might as well know what it is. Exactly. And that's how I approach my own creative process too. It does start with the images and then rather quickly the form finds its way in. And then at some point, the purpose also, the purpose of the author, uh, the purpose of the form and the purpose of the man. And ultimately it's, it's all, it's all one product, you know, it's, <laughs> it's three reasons, one product, almost a kind of a, a Trinity type of analog there. Uh, but ultimately it should be one 
story that uh, hopefully brings glory to God and serves the reader. Okay, well, let's hear from you, our fantastic fans. What do you think about Lewis's wisdom, about the author, the form, the man? What do you think about the messages that Lewis put in his books? What did you take away from Narnia or his other novels like the Space Trilogy? If you've read this, the, well, I'm sorry, the Ransom Trilogy. I still call it the Space Trilogy. You can call it whatever you want. But out of the silent I, was, planet, I wasn't going to say anything. I was just going <laughs> to I wasn't going to nitpick. That would have been terrible. <laughs> yes, the, the Cosmic Trilogy or the Ransom Trilogy because the term space seems to belie uh, Lewis's medieval conception of the heavens, which are not empty like space. It's not a howling cold void, but is actually warm and is filled uh, with the glory of the creator. Well, there you go. There, there's a very clear message and theme that Lewis wove into those books. So. What do you think about those books or what do you think about this topic in general? If you are a creator, if you're a Christian who's creating something for some purpose, let us know. Email us at podcast at lorehaven.com or you can uh, leave a comment for us on social media. We'd we'd love it if you would write us a review or subscribe. But we really want to hear from you. Uh, You're a listener. We want to know what you think about this topic. So Send us a message to podcast at lorehaven.com. We would love to read that on a future episode. Also, you can subscribe to Lorehaven, the webzine we release every quarter. Get our fall 2020 webzine, which is releasing next month with a complement of 12 plus reviews of the best Christian made fantasy, science fiction, and other speculative novels that we could find. We make that available for subscribers, and it is a free subscription. Just go to lorehaven.com slash subscribe and enter your email address, say hi, and we'll make sure to contact you when that new issue is ready. Uh, meanwhile, uh, my colleague at the uh, the Speculative Faith blog at Lorehaven, uh, she's Rebecca Luella Miller, and she, for uh, anyone who wants to try their hand at a little bit of a writing exercise, is hosting the uh, Spec Faith uh, Fall 2020 Writers Contest. So she's making a little prize available she does this i think twice a year and it's a really cool way to exercise that imagination whether or not you feel oh i'm a writer i'm a creative person it's fun head on over there and uh, get your entries in Uh, should still be open uh, by the time you listen to this podcast on uh, tuesday next on fantastical truth what happens when a paranormal reporter terminal underachiever and staunch cynic of the human race stumbles into a world of real gods, spirit beings, and a lot of weirdness. And how can paranormal and horror stories like Mike Duran's Reagan Moon series uniquely help Christians grow in their imagination of our real world's battles between good and evil? Mike is going to join us, and we're going to explore his incredible worlds together. Meanwhile, as you enjoy stories, or maybe even try your hand at creating stories, don't ignore your dual identities. In God, you are an author who reflects his image by using your imagination to create images and give them form. Yet in Jesus, you are also a new person on mission to share his gospel with others and serve your world. Great Christian-made stories need all of the above. So let's accept no halfway manufactured substitutes as we continue to seek and find fantastical truth.